the American Civil War raged from 1861 to 1865 and saw the death of more than 600,000 soldiers. Men were killed by rifle fire, artillery fire, by sword and infection. But did you know that during the war, at least 500 men were killed by firing squad because of desertion? This is more than all the other wars put together fought by the United States since that time. These men were shot by their own side, by their own comrades, often in view of thousands of spectators. And I use the word spectators on purpose. More on that in a little bit. But why were so many killed by firing squad? Did both sides apply this terrible punishment on their own men? Did prominent generals have differing views on the process? And perhaps most importantly for the convicted men, was it a quick and efficient way of execution? The term firing squad wasn't even seen as a term of military discipline at the outbreak of the war. By the early 1860s, the term was more of an honorary one, used for things like salutes, funerals and military processions, but it soon gained a more grim and sinister meaning. At the start of the war, perhaps both sides, Union and Confederate, did not put too much thought into the need for killing their own soldiers. Despite this though, the Articles of War of 1806 were still in print and were about to be put into practice. Most cases of insubordination, drunkenness and disobedience were dealt on a company or regimental level. But as we shall see, the need for more severe rules when it came to desertion only grew as the war increased in scale and savagery. The ritual of killing one's own men may have seemed a distant thought, but for so many men, it was already on paper in black and white. The Confederate Articles of War, 1861, specified that all officers and soldiers who have received pay or have been duly enlisted in the services of the Confederate States and shall be convicted of having deserted the same shall suffer death or such other punishment as, by sentence of a court-martial, shall be inflicted. As well, the general orders of the War Department, 1861, 1862 and 63, directed those that men convicted of desertion were to be shot to death with musketry at such time and place as the commanding general may direct. In the early months of the war, before desertion was becoming an extreme headache for commanders, even President Lincoln had to voice his opinion. He knew all too well public opinion would not sanction military executions. He said, You can't order men shot by dozens or twenties. People won't stand it. Early in the war, a deserter may have been treated leniently with such other punishments, such as hard labour, forfeiture of pay, no leave, being dismissed, having to wear a placard with the word deserter on it, or, still better than death, a deserter could have been branded with a D on his hip to denote he was a deserter. In 1862, many men were being sentenced to death by firing squad, but few were actually having that sentence put into practice. In that summer, only 12% of deserters were sentenced to death by hanging or firing squad, but only 40% of those actually had the sentence carried out. But as the war progressed and thundered back and forth, as food shortages in the South started to bite, as enemy incursions threatened men's homes, desertions started to increase. This was very noticeable with conscripts in particular. It was recorded that Virginia soldiers were liable to leave for extended periods, especially when the enemy were close to their homes and when there was a need in the fields for spring planting and the harvest in the fall. Things got so bad that Confederate General James Longstreet noted that, at one point, he had on paper 32,000 men under his command, and out of that number, 7,000 were absent without leave. In an effort to petition for the return of those missing, one governor wrote a reassuring affirmation that stated, Many of you have doubtless remained at home after the expiration date of your furloughs, without the intention to desert the cause of your country. Many of you have left your commands without leave, under the mistaken notion that the highest duty required you to provide sustenance and protection to your families. I am authorized to say that all who will without delay voluntarily return to their commands will receive a lenient and merciful consideration, and that none who so return within forty days from this date will have the penalty of death inflicted on them. 
The first executions for desertion in the Army of Northern Virginia at Mount Pisgah in August of 1862. Three soldiers of Brigadier General Taliaferro's division and two from Brigadier General Early's division, all from the Shenandoah Valley or from the counties of West Virginia, were shot by firing squad under orders from Lieutenant General Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Colonel Samuel French, who was Jackson's aide, wrote, The preservation of the army itself was dependent on the maintenance of discipline, and discipline could not be had if desertions were longer to go unpunished. Even Robert Lee was forced to inform the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, that unless the stream of deserters could be checked, I fear the army cannot be kept together, encourages others to hope for like impunity. Lee, who had regularly recommended leniency for deserters, had to change his mind. Distressed to do so, he was soon calling for stricter punishments. Even if the commander-in-chief had reservations about this ultimate deterrent, many of his commanders were less concerned about the use of firing squads. The Confederate Army of Tennessee, under Braxton Bragg, had deserters summarily shot without trial, according to the memoirs of Sam Watkins. Punishments in the Army of Northern Virginia became more and more severe, and court-martials and executions became a matter of daily routine. According to army records, executions continued until the evacuation of Richmond and Petersburg. The Richmond Daily Dispatch in September 1863 reported on a Confederate firing squad. In the middle of the afternoon on the 5th of September, 10 deserters from the 3rd North Carolina Infantry under Lieutenant General Richard Earls Corps were executed near Orange Court House. The division of the condemned men was formed on three sides of a square, with sidearms and without colours. The paper reported, Whilst ten stakes ranged in a row on the fourth side, making the line where the execution would take place. The prisoners under escort followed the officer of the day into the square, followed in turn by the brigade band, playing the Dead March. The bearing of the prisoners was calm and self-possessed. They marched to the place of their execution, with a step as accurate in its cadence as that of the guard who conducted them. Before the assembled division, the officer of the day read their offenses and their sentences. The regimental chaplain then knelt with the prisoners in prayer. Their comrades, used as they were to the blood and carnage of twenty battlefields, beheld with uncontrollable emotion the solemn preparation for the execution of the condemned. They seemed to be penetrated with the solemnity of the religious services which were being carried on. The prisoners were then tied to their stakes, their arms pinioned behind their backs. Ten firing squads, each led by a non-commissioned officer, advanced. The condemned men were blindfolded to shut out the sight of the muzzles of the muskets levelled not more than ten paces from them. But according to the reporter, the ten broke out into loud and frequent appeals to the Almighty to have mercy on their souls and pardon their sins. But the officer of the day gave the command, Ready, and the clicking of the locks alone broke the silence that prevailed. Aim. And the muzzles of the guns were pointed with unerring aim at the breasts of the miserable condemned, and the very breathing of the crowd seemed stopped in a terrible suspense. Fire, and the corpses of ten men hung, in the horrible relaxation of death to the stakes where they were pinioned. The division then filed past the dead, leaving the field to the burial detail. So perish those who would betray their country in its hour of need and peril. The sentence of these men was as just as their execution was prompt. Necessity demanded their blood, justice approved, and even tearful mercy sanctioned it. But no matter how much executions can be seen as a necessary evil, there were occurrences where they seemed to have gone beyond just a necessity. In February 1864, Major General Pickett, famous for the charge which took his name at Gettysburg, gave an order for the hanging of 20 prisoners of war. It is thought that Pickett believed the men to be deserters from the Army of Northern Virginia. This event must have been of such a horror to the Union forces that it was only the personal intervention of Ulysses S. Grant that prevented Pickett from being arrested and charged with war crimes. After the hangings, Reverend Paris then read a sermon in front of the entire brigade to drive home the importance of maintaining strict devotion to the Confederate cause. He compared deserters to Judas Iscariot 
and Benedict Arnold, suggesting that discontent with the army was caused by meetings where disaffected soldiers talk more about their rights than their duty and loyalty to their country. And by those who claimed, We are whipped. It is useless to fight any longer. This is the rich man's war and the poor man's fight. He also castigated clergymen who preached defeatist messages and noted that newspapers and letters from home pushed some soldiers over the edge, so that the young man once of promise and hope now becomes a deserter. But even though the number of men executed is still high, throughout the war actual sentencing of deserters to death was considered low. Historian Tracy Power stated that Lee, his officers and the Confederate authorities would all struggle to strike a balance between severity and leniency when dealing with deserters. And although deserters were often convicted by court-martial, individual sentences varied so widely that their value as a deterrent was virtually non-existent. Soldiers were even persuaded to desert by their loved ones back home. One rebel soldier wrote, Many of our people at home have become so demoralized that they write to their husbands, sons and brothers that desertion is now not dishonorable. The media of the time also held negative views towards the use of firing squads. An editorial penned for the Augusta Daily Chronicle and Sentinel questioned the effectiveness of execution when it wrote, What a sad warning to the living. Will any profit by it? But the act of carrying out the sentence of a firing squad was more than just shooting a soldier. There was ritual, ceremony to be enacted. It could almost be seen as a piece of theatre, a sinister drama which was designed to instill terror. Desertion, if not stamped out, would continually threaten the effectiveness and cohesiveness of an army. So making an example of a man who abandoned his comrades, his colours and his nation was of paramount importance. The execution would not be hidden away and done in secret. All too often, the execution would be performed in front of thousands of soldiers and members of the public. It was designed to have an emotional and psychological impact on all who were watching. To add real impact, often coffins were positioned directly behind the condemned man so the body would fall into it after being shot by multiple bullets. A Confederate diary records in great detail exactly what an execution involved. On one occasion I saw two men executed, men who had been tried by a court-martial and sentenced to be shot. I'm sure it will interest my young friends to know exactly how it is done, so I will describe the affair. It was in the fall or early part of the winter of 1861 to 1862, while our army was stationed at Centerville. We had in the army a battalion of men from Louisiana, known as the Tiger Rifles. They wore zoo AV uniforms, that is, baggy knee breeches, stockings, a jacket, and a turban. Each one carried a large camp knife in a sheath suspended from his waist belt. They were said to be rough men, requiring the strictest discipline by the officers. Two of them had overpowered an officer and was about to kill him, and for this they had been court-martialed and condemned to be shot. Announcement had been made in an order from General Johnston, commanding the army at that time, that the execution would take place on a certain day, and it seemed to be expected that it would be witnessed by the whole army. During all the forenoon of the designated day, crowds of soldiers could be seen wending their way to the place where the execution was to take place. When I reached the place, there were probably five thousand soldiers already on the ground. Three sides of a hollow square, the sides probably four hundred feet long, had been formed, and sentinels were marching up and down keeping the crowd back. On the open side of the square were two posts standing about two feet out of the ground and perhaps thirty feet apart. The crowd rapidly increased until probably fifteen thousand men were standing on the three sides of the hollow square. I had a position in the front row, but the crowd behind kept pushing forward, and the sentinel threatened repeatedly to put his bayonet into those of us in front if we did not stand back. Finally, the prisoners arrived. They came in a wagon, which also contained their coffins. They were led to the posts and made to kneel down with their backs to them. Their hands were tied behind them and then tied to the posts, and they were blindfolded. Two platoons of twelve soldiers each were marched out in front of them. They were of the same command with the men who were to be shot. Of the guns in each platoon had balls in them 
the others being loaded with blank cartridges, that is, cartridges without balls. But no soldier knew which guns had the ball cartridges in them, as they had been loaded by others. The officer in charge of the two platoons stood somewhat to their front, where he could readily be seen by all of the men of the two platoons. Without saying a word, he raised his hands, and the men brought their guns to the position of aim. He dropped his hand, and they fired. The orders were given silently by these movements, so that the prisoners would not know the exact moment when they would be killed. It was a very sad sight, and one that deeply impressed me. The mention of only some men having fully loaded weapons is a legend that can be found mirrored in the First World War. Having a blank cartridge would be called a conscience round, which would hopefully remove the feeling of guilt from a soldier who had been ordered to shoot dead a former comrade. Men may have been able to tell if their rifle had fired a live round, or perhaps not. To see our video on the Civil War soldier who loaded his rifle 23 times without firing it, click here or follow the link in the description box below. But to give a soldier a glimmer of hope that he may not have been the one to deliver the killing blow would have been an important aspect. Not all men are happy to shoot another man, be he enemy or friend, and it is possible that men fired wide or high to avoid shooting the condemned at all. The soldiers in the firing squad would also know that despite being close to their target, their weapons were still not perfect and could be inaccurate. They would be aiming at a small piece of card or cloth pinned to the man's heart, and yet a volley could miss all the vital organs and leave the prisoner alive, writhing and in agony. According to an 1864 report on a firing squad execution published in the Vicksburg Herald, one soldier from the 49th Regiment Coloured Infantry had to be dispatched by pistol, immediate death not resulting from the wounds by the muskets. Harper's Weekly said of an 1863 mass firing squad execution, The scene was now becoming painful to the spectators, and many turned away, not wishing to witness more of the awful ceremony. Witnesses could also find the spectacle difficult to watch. According to the Louisville Daily Journal in 1863, the scene was now becoming painful to the spectators, and many turned away, not wishing to witness more of the awful ceremony. Sometimes soldiers charged with firing the deadly rounds deliberately missed their target, the burden of killing in this fashion proving too much. More soldiers recalled the punishments meted out on their comrades in letters home. The following is a letter from Spencer Glasgow Welch, a surgeon in the 13th South Carolina Volunteer Infantry. He writes to his wife from a camp near the Rappahannock River. A man was shot near our regiment last Sunday for desertion. It was a very solemn scene. The condemned man was seated on his coffin with his hands tied across his breast. A file of twelve soldiers was brought up to within six feet of him, and at the command, a volley was fired right into his breast. These severe punishments seem necessary to preserve discipline. Harper's Weekly also printed an account of a deserter's execution of September 1863. One of those who witnessed the execution of the Louisiana Tigers was one Lieutenant William Ellum of the 18th Virginia Infantry. He recalled the size of the crowd. I was one of about 15,000 in number to witness a few days ago, the solemn sight of two soldiers being shot. Private Lee of the 19th Virginia, who was also in attendance, recalled watching soldiers, moving on over the hills from sunup to 12 o'clock, the hour of execution. Every hill presented the appearance of a swarm of bees. He also noticed that the trees of the adjoining woods were crowded as if by wild pigeons. Onlookers also commented, on how condemned men arrived at the execution site, as well as the soldiers accompanying them. Stationed at Fort Sumter in the summer of 1863, William Grimble devoted most of a letter to his sister on preparations for the execution for a soldier accused of attempting to desert to the Union Navy stationed offshore. The prisoner was brought in a procession consisting of the provost marshal and then the colonel. The band played a dead march, next the prisoner and Bishop Lynch, then the coffin, borne by four men, then the file of men to shoot him, one half with their muskets loaded with ball, the other half with blank cartridges, so that no one might know who shot him. When the procession arrived at the square, we commenced on the right and marched along the sides round the square to the left, the band of the procession playing the dead march until it reached the left of the first regiment. It stopped, and the band of that regiment took up the dirge, 
and so it continued of each regiment playing, and the prisoner arrived in front of them. It would appear, even late in the war, men on both sides noted the difference between witnessing death on a battlefield and watching an execution. A soldier from North Carolina suggested that witnessing one is a much more shocking scene than a battle, for in battle the blood is up and men are excited, and as no one expects to be hit positively, he feels a hope. But in these military executions, the blood is cool and the doom of the victim certain, and it freezes the blood to witness it. Watching a carefully choreographed death clearly not only freezes the blood, but focuses attention in such a way that allows for mentally replaying the affair when it comes time to create a written account. And what of the prisoner? A condemned man generally spent his final moments fastened to a post, being counselled by a religious advisor and in close proximity to his own coffin. Next came the positioning of the firing squad, and then final orders. William Grimble recalled that once the procession halted, the prisoner was carried to the post, and some minutes were spent in religious exercise before a cartridge bag was drawn over his head. Arthur Ford recalled that one condemned man jerked open his shirt and bared his breast to the bullets as the final commands were issued. They met their fate without a sigh, without a murmur, asserted another onlooker. Executions were not just a method to carry out punishments and maintain unit cohesion. They offered soldiers an opportunity to think about the kind of death they wanted for themselves. Did one want to die well, facing the end like a man? Or was he willing to be seen as having ended his life in shame and ignominy? Death in combat might be glorified after the fact, but there was no real way to see execution in a positive light, since such an end shamed not only the condemned man, but also his family back home. After one condemned man received permission for friends to sing a hymn during his execution, a Confederate officer recounted spent his final moments praying aloud that he might be received into that better land. Marion Fitzpatrick watched the execution of two men, one from the 14th Georgia and the other from a North Carolina unit. He was pleased to learn that the Georgian had expressed a willingness to die and said he had a hope in Christ. But as for the North Carolinian, Fitzpatrick said, he was a sorry looking man and from what I can learn would talk to no one after he was condemned. The need for spiritual relief at the final moment was often observed, but not all the time. The hope of hearing the right words was made all the more desirable in light of the sharp transition that was about to take place. Charles Quintard, a chaplain in the 1st Tennessee Infantry, prepared a soldier for death and urged him to repent. One poor fellow, under Quintard's guidance, urged him to cut off a lock of his hair and preserve it for his wife. Shortly afterwards, he stood up and addressed his comrades, declaring, I am about to die. I hope I am going to a better world. Take warning by my fate. As it happened, that soldier's life was spared at the last moment. In stark contrast, one Virginian from Page County responded simply, No, nothing. When asked whether he had anything to say. After the order to fire was given, he gasped, fell back and cried out, Oh, what will my poor wife do? Observers tried, sometimes in vain, to put down on paper their emotions after witnessing a firing squad. Martin Coiner of the 52nd Virginia described the moment of execution one of the greatest sights that I ever want to behold again. For James Pickens, of the 5th Alabama, the orders to fire brought about an indescribable and mixed sensation of sickness and horror at the sight. After an October 1864 execution, another man from Alabama, Captain John Hall, could only pray I may never again be called upon to see. While Marion Fitzpatrick asserted, I shall never forget the impression it made on me. For at least one Mississippi man, the gruesome details of an execution served to reinforce his role as disciplinarian while he was far away from his family. He used the deaths of the two Louisiana Tigers as examples of what happened to soldiers who would not behave themselves. These bad men that would not obey orders fell over dead. In closing, he urged his sons to be good little boys. Despite the emotional toll of having to witness executions, Evidence suggests that Confederates overwhelmingly supported the practice as a deterrent to desertion. While Arthur Ford, for example, acknowledged that 
it seemed a sad thing that a really brave man should be sacrificed. He was quick to point out, it is necessary to deter others from playing the role of traitor. Seeing deserters as traitors allowed Ford to more easily balance his emotions and to justify executions as necessary to achieve the moral goal of Confederate independence. Captain Robert E. Park, who served with the 12th Alabama, commented that the latest execution was a sad sight, but balanced that with an assertion that his death was necessary as a warning and lesson to his comrades. Spencer Welsh found it unfortunate that this thing of shooting men for desertion was not begun sooner. He speculated that many men will now have to be shot before the trouble can be stopped. For most soldiers, however, perceived deterrent effects sufficiently justified the cruelty and humiliation involved in executions. The soldiers observed, soldiers usually had no sympathy for prisoners executed for the offences of spying, raping or deserting to the enemy. But soldiers disagreed on whether executions for other offences, such as sleeping on guard or desertion from the army, were justified. He also argues that as citizen soldiers, Civil War soldiers tended to challenge executions for desertion as unjust. Private Moses Parker from Vermont wrote in a family letter that battlefield scenes are bad enough but are not compared to the one we witness today, the shooting of a comrade for desertion. Charles William Bardeen from Massachusetts also emphasized in his memoir the difference between battlefield killings and executions. In battle, men fall all around you, but you don't know who it is going to be or when. To see a man sitting on his coffin and know that the instant the word is given, he will pass out of this life in another is solemn. The woeful comparison of battlefield and execution killings in these soldiers' words emphasizes a distinction that soldiers tended to make between the two kinds of death. Similarly, Union soldier Charles H. Lynch heard a few faint cheers from some of the boys when the prisoner received a last-minute pardon from President Lincoln. We were thankful that we did not have to witness the execution. Soldiers endorsed the practice of executing deserters generally, but did not wish to see a specific person executed. More interesting evidence comes from a news article published during the war, A Solemn Warning to Wives. Reporting the execution of a deserter, the article claimed that it was ascertained the deserter was as true as steel to our cause, and that it was on account of his wife that he deserted. He received a letter from her full of complaints. While explicitly saying that the deserter was not responsible for his offence, the article did not even hint that the penalty was unjust, but rather tried to maximise utility from the execution by warning wives not to complain in letters. Necessity seems to be the only consideration behind executions for desertion. Confederate Sergeant McHenry Howard received the order of a deserter's execution with a direction that the sentence should not be communicated to the prisoners until the morning of the day fixed for the execution. He wrote in his memoir, I passed a wretched night with broken sleep and dreams that I had overslept myself and had waked to find the sun high in the heavens and that I was full of remorse at having lost the men so much of their scanty time for preparation. Before Union General George Gordon executed five deserters on August 29th, 1863, the deserters had petitioned him for clemency or, alternately, an extension of their execution. We at the present time are unprepared to die. Two of us are Roman Catholics. We have no priest and two are Protestants. One is a Jew and has no rabbi to assist us in preparing to meet our God. While refusing to reduce their sentences, Meade managed to find proper clergymen for the prisoners. His efforts were appreciated, at least by a newspaper. The spectacle it read was an unusual one. The Protestant, the Hebrew, and the Catholic stood side by side, uttering prayers for the departed souls. Another soldier named Johnson must have experienced one of the worst executions by firing squad. Two German soldiers in the firing party did not discharge their guns. Johnson died a slow and torturous death, and the two soldiers as punishment were immediately put in irons. Many soldiers probably had similar difficulties shooting at their former comrades, and the custom of not loading all guns was intended to solve this problem. The Confederate physician Spencer Glasgow Welch again wrote about an execution. 
The prisoner was hit by but one ball because 11 of the guns were loaded with powder only. This was done so that no man can be certain that he killed him. If he was, the thought of it might always be painful to him. In other cases, half of the guns could be loaded, or all could be loaded but one. However, when the prisoner was especially hated, such as when he deserted not to the rear, but to the enemy, such custom could be abandoned. It would seem that the condemned man was unpopular, only one weapon was loaded with a bullet. This bullet could kill the man outright, or it could only wound him. This would leave him in agony until an officer would deliver the coup de grace with a pistol. Hatred of men who deserted to the enemy could also be found north of the Mason-Dixon line. In this next tale, it appears that the soldiers wanted to make sure the prisoner was killed outright and straight away. Union soldier Charles William Bardeen wrote, When a company of the 71st Indiana captured one of their own number who had become a deserter and a spy, they all begged for permission to shoot him. The number detailed was 15, and 15 bullets were found in his body. Perhaps less terrible than having to shoot a comrade, but equally grim, was the task of a surgeon at an execution. Immediately after the firing, surgeons would examine the body, which could be a grave moral burden on them. Union physician John Gardner Perry wrote before an execution, I expect to be detailed as one of the surgeons to examine the body after it falls. I feel too sad to write. The troops should move past the body in slow time, probably to deepen their impressions of the execution. This practice, however, could distress the already horrified soldiers and devastate morale. Confederate Private John Milton Hubbard observed that after an execution, there was a profound sensation among the soldiers, which it took a battle to shake off. Officials sought to counter this sensation by speeding up the process and directing the band to play music. Union officer Josiah Marshall Favell wrote that when the execution was over, the band struck up a lively air, and at a quick step, the troops marched back to their camps. Union soldier William Bircher also wrote, The bands and the drum corps of the division struck up a quick step as the division marched past the grave. But as a musician, he could not help being sensible of the harsh contrast between the lively music and the fearfully solemn scene he had just witnessed. The transition from the dead march to the quick step was quite too sudden. Observers could receive different messages from the rituals, depending on their individual sensitivities and roles in the ritual of execution. When General Gordon was preparing for the execution of a deserter, a local civilian approached him. Is it true, General, that you are going to shoot one of your men today? He continued, my dear sir, you must not think any worse of me if I say this execution is a dreadful thing. And yet it is an incident of the war, it is historical, and bless my soul, sir, I want to see it, and I should like to take my little boys with me. The civilian who brought his six, eight, and ten-year-old sons to witness the execution was first on the field and the last to leave it. So what can we learn from these tales? The use of firing squads during the American Civil War started off slowly, and though not becoming an epidemic, it was soon seen in many quarters as part of normal military routine. From presidents to privates, from generals to members of the public, it appears a consensus that though a dreadful event, the extreme end of military justice was required, and required by both sides. It is an interesting statistic that during the First World War, the British Army, infamous in its discipline, shot a total of 306 soldiers for desertion and cowardice. This has been seen as a brutal example of military discipline, considering the hell men have been through. And the number has always seemed staggeringly high, but it is actually lower than those condemned in the American Civil War. If you've enjoyed this look at the brutal discipline of the American Civil War, you'll love our video on shell shock and the mysterious tale of a soldier who loaded his rifle 23 times without firing it. Thanks for watching.